Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it's Ajahn Brahm back again. Well, I just thought you might have thought right, that Ayachanda had transformed into Ajahn Brahm. And <laughs> she's over there. <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed this a, um, guided meditation. And now we have the Sutta class. Oh. Go on. Could we just say? Could I just say? Of course you can. <laughs> Shouldn't really ask permission because I'm going to say it anyway. Um, that during the class, I generally will speak um, the word of the Buddha from this uh, little book that he translated, retranslated, and we will take questions. So, what we'll ask you to do is write them to Derek, and then when Ajahn says, Are there any questions? Derek will send whatever he has, but please keep them related to the Sutta content. And this evening's uh, question session will be more open for all kinds of themes, okay? So we might not get to everybody's question because we do want to uh, try to get through uh, quite a bit of the Buddha's teachings, okay? So whenever Ajahn says any questions, then Derek can pass them along. Is that good, Derek? Super. All right, take Excellent. it away. So here we go. And I hope you can bear with me, but when it Whenever I do suttas, I always, because I've been a monk for such a long time, I always do a namo tassa before I do the suttas, out of respect for the Dhamma and for the one who taught this, the Buddha. Namo tassa bhagavato alahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato Alamato Samba Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Alamato Samba Sambuddhasa So today uh, I'm going to read out uh, the, this is all from the suttas, but uh, I shortened the translations, made different uh, rendering for some important words to make sure that it's more accurate and you don't get um, tired by all the repetitions. But anyway, you're going to start off with the Four Noble Truths, a very uh, basic teaching of the Buddha, and that starts to include many other uh, things such as the five candors and what they are and what exactly these things mean. So here we go. No, I can read this fine. Yes. So I have to have a little bit of difficulty, otherwise <laughs> it wouldn't relate to the first uh, teaching, which is a noble truth of suffering. Now what is? The, no the noble truth of suffering. Rebirth is suffering. Aging is suffering. I know that by personal experience now. Uh, I told the monks in Bodhinyana Monastery where I live that I'm getting old. And they said, no, Ajahn Brahm, you are not getting old. You're already old. Death is suffering. So lamentation, pain, unhappiness, and distress are suffering. Sometimes the people reply of sorrow, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair are suffering. Those actual words are better translations are more accurate and meaningful for people. Experiencing what is unpleasant is suffering. And missing what is pleasing is suffering. Not getting what one wants is suffering. In short, the five components of existence, uh, they usually call the five candors, that fully describe your body and mind are suffering. And the point there that these five candors fully describe the body and the mind. It's the way that the Buddha split up these five things uh, which make up who you are. But now, 
the Buddha often taught like this. He gave the, the summary at the beginning and then took it part by part to explain what he meant. What is rebirth? This is an important statement because in okay, so this is always suffering. I've got this one over here. Oh, you missed a page. Huh? Yeah, that's page seven. This is okay. You want me to go back again? That's the start. That's the start. Okay. <laughs> We're going to go back to the Four Noble Truths. Uh, in, okay, on the on page five. Okay. So, I've been told that I missed a page, and so I'm always a very um, understanding monk and easy to look after and quite obedient. Should I say that? The Four Noble Truths again. The Buddha addressed the community thus It is through not fully understanding and penetrating the Four Noble Truths that I, as well as you, have experienced a cycle of rebirth and death for a very long time. Because of not fully understanding the noble truth of suffering, we have experienced a cycle of rebirth and death by not fully understanding the noble truth of the origin of suffering, the noble truth of the cessation of suffering, and the noble truth of the path leading to the cessation of suffering. That we have for a long time experience a cycle of rebirth and death by not under fully understanding the Four Noble Truths. That's what causes you to be reborn. And I would say on this point that many people think that they understand the Four Noble Truths. But if you fully understood those Four Noble Truths, then you will be an enlightened one. Understanding those Four Noble Truths does not mean that you know them in Pali, in English, in German, or any other language. It means you understand the experience of what these things are. And the full understanding means uh, that you have penetrated to the Dharma of Buddhism. And as the Buddha said, so long as my penetration and insight into these Four Noble Truths, as they really are, was not thoroughly complete in their three phases and 12 aspects, then I did not claim to have awakened the unsurpassed perfect enlightenment in the world. But when my penetration and insight into these four noble truths as they really are, was thoroughly complete in their three phases and 12 aspects, then did I claim to have awakened the unsurpassed perfect enlightenment in this world. Many people can say they are enlightened, but have they really understood, penetrated to the very end thoroughly, these Four Noble Truths? Most of them, of course, haven't. And in order to, have you, they got copies of these? Yes. Okay. If you see the copies of these, Okay, it's a similar translation, but anyway, when it gets to the point of asking questions, then you can actually pick up on if there's any different translation. And the Four Noble Truths, first the Noble Truth of Suffering, you may see that to make it easier to understand, I listed these as 1A, 1B, 1C, 2A, 2B, 2C, 3A, 3B, 3C, and 4A, 4B, 4C. In other words, to listed these in a more modern way, which makes it easier to understand. So the Four Noble Truths in their three aspects, the three phases, first of all, to know what the Noble of Suffering is, Noble Truth of Suffering is, and one B, that suffering is to be fully understood. That does not mean you have to suffer every pain and difficulty there is in the world but to understand it at its root, what that really is. And then afterwards that suffering has been fully understood, 
when you've completed that phase. And then this is the noble truth of the origin of suffering. So this is the noble truth of the origin of suffering. And that is wanting that causes rebirth. And wanting the origin of suffering is to be abandoned. And when wanting the origin of suffering has been abandoned, it is no more wanting, no more craving, no more dhanha left. That means that you have fully understood the second phase of these four noble truths. And then this is a noble truth of the cessation of suffering, which is extinguishing the wanting. And the end of wanting, the cessation of suffering, is to be realized. And when the end of wanting, the cessation of suffering has been realized, then you fulfill that third phase. And the fourth phase, this is a noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering, the Noble Eightfold Path, to understand that. And the Noble Eightfold Path, the way to the cessation of suffering, is not just to be understood, is to be developed. This is where they use the word bhavana, which means, that's usually, the, often we call that, that's our practice. We develop the Noble Eightfold Path, little by little, until it becomes perfected. And that's 4C, the Noble Path, a way to the cessation of suffering has been developed. And this is what you hear in the suttas again and again and again. Thus, in regard to things unheard before in this generation, they were heard before a long time ago in the dispensations of earlier Buddhas, but this is regard to things unheard before in this generation. There arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge, and light. And then the Buddha said, I consider this Dharma that has been awakened to is profound, hard to see and hard to understand, peaceful and sublime, unattainable by mere reasoning subtle to be experienced by the wise. Straight away, that has some wonderful teachings in there. It is profound, hard to see, hard to understand. But it's also peaceful and sublime. If the Dharma, which you understand, causes stress and causes um, a lot of busyness for you, it cannot be the real Dharma. The real Dharma is peaceful and sublime. And you can't attain it just by reasoning. It's more than that. It's through experiencing, which goes beyond reasoning. And it's subtle to be experienced by the wise. And the Buddha continues, but this generation delights in attachment to a self, takes delight in the attachment to a self, and rejoices in the attachment to a self. It is hard for such a generation to see this truth, namely the empty process of cause and effect, dependent cessation and origination. The empty process of cause and effect is not affecting something, the cause creates the effect, the effect is the cause of something else, and that's how this process keeps going on. And whenever people usually say, oh, that's dependent origination, I prefer to add that the other half of dependent origination, which is called dependent cessation. You can't have dependent origination without dependent cessation. Furthermore, said the Buddha, it is hard to embrace this truth, namely the stilling and disappearance of the will. Sabha Sankara Samatha. And that is a beautiful statement because there I use the translation of Sankara as the will, which is a legitimate translation of the word Sankara. Sankara has two parts to it. You know, the, the active part of Sankara, which is the will, Chaitana, and the result of that will. And this is one of the reasons why to understanding the stilling of that will is very difficult for people to embrace. The relinquishing of everything that has been acquired, 
As I mentioned, Ajahn Chai used to tell me, you meditate to let go of things, not to acquire more things. The destruction of wanting, instead of calling that dunha craving, craving is okay, but it doesn't go deeper into the far extent of dunha. Tanha, the usual word which people translate as craving, is much more than craving. It's wanting even small things. Everything fading away. Cessation. Nirvana. And even the word Nirvana. When I started learning Pali, I had a brain. I'd have got my O levels in part in sorry in Latin. And the structure of Pali is pretty similar to the structure of Latin. So it wasn't that hard to learn Pali. And when I learned Pali and started studying the Vinaya, these are the monastic rules, then you came across that word, Nibbana, which is the now, and you saw that it comes from a verb, and that verb is used very often in ordinary daily life. Even children would tell their mummy, mummy, the oil lamp, the flame of the oil lamp has gone out. It's Nibbana. These were words in common usage. So people in that time, they would look at a word like Nibbana and they would understand it very easily. It's what happens to a flame when it gets extinguished, when it's not burning anymore. And then the Buddha says, there are beings with little dust in their eyes that are wasting through not hearing this Dharma. There'll be those who will understand this Dharma. And that's why the Buddha taught it. So, any questions, comments or complaints? Yes. Wow. Can you explain further what you mean by dependent cessation, please? Yes, very often we do a dependent origination from delusion, we get will, from the will, we get the arising of consciousness, and from consciousness, we get Nama Rupa, the objects of consciousness. That dependent origination, many people know that. But also, the Buddha said, with the uh, ending of delusion, the ceasing of delusion, there's the ceasing of the will. When the will ceases, there's a ceasing of the consciousness in your next life. The ceasing of consciousness is the ceasing of the objects of consciousness. And with all these ceasing, there comes a ceasing, I'm just going through it fast, the ceasing of craving or wanting. And when wanting ceases, then this upadana, I don't like calling that attachment because it means basically taking up things. And it literally means that upadana, the word, the prefix upa is pretty similarly used to the English word up. And ardana, you may remember that from Adina Ardana Veramanisi Karpadang Samadhi Ami. So when one thing ceases, the other thing ceases. And with the um, ceasing of Upadana, taking things up, there becomes the ceasing of existence. Bawa ceases. And when Bawa ceases, there's a ceasing of rebirth. When rebirth ceases, there's the ceasing of old age, sickness, and death. That is the teaching, dependent cessation. When one thing ceases, the other thing ceases. And one of the great similes of that taught by the Buddha uh, was in the Agawachagota Sutta. And that I adapt it, but imagine that there is an oil lamp. Well, let's make it even more as, uh, easy to understand. There was a candle flame. The flame of the candle depends on the wick, the wax, and the heat. And if any of those three causes, the wax of the candle, the wick, or the heat, 
ceases, then the candle ceases, the light goes. And this is what I meant when in the time of the Buddha, people would say the light is Nibbana. It's gone. It's, just, it's a usual word. It was not a metaphysical word all the time. It was used metaphysically. A simple word, which is in common usage at that time, was used to describe a flame going up. And in that sutta, the Buddha asked Vajrakota, where does the flame go? If that flame was a good flame and behaved itself and never burnt anything, does it go to the heaven where all flames can flicker endlessly without any suffering? Or does it go to a whole place if it's burned somebody and thereby just suffer for the rest of its existence? That's a stupid talk. The flame doesn't go anywhere. It just ceases. So that's dependent cessation. Another one, okay. Ah, oh, can you please explain Sankara related to will? Sankara is not related to will. Sankara is will. If you look at like the dependent origination, dependent cessation, the three Sankaras, Kaya Sankara, Vacha Sankara, no, was it? Yeah, Vacha Sankara and Chitta Sankara. And they're usually called volitional formations. In other words, what is volition? It is will. And this is actually how the Buddha described it. Uh, that Chaitanya is that Sankara. Chaitanya is another word for will. Of course, that makes it far more clear to people and also far more challenging. Can you calm down your will and allow it to cease? Can you let go? And if you can, meditation becomes so easy and so blissful and things disappear. That's what the Buddha meant by Sabbat Sankara Samatha. It's a very beautiful word. Samatha is things calm down, become still and disappear. Okay, as many of these stories, very often, if you close your eyes, then after a while, it's not you see nothing, you don't see at all. The sense of sight turns off. Because the sense of sight and all your senses can only keep going if there's something changing. If there's a, a constant like background noise somewhere, you can't hear anything at all after a while. And that's one of the reasons why when you develop stillness, the five senses turn off and disappear. So similar to computers, as I mentioned, I think in the first talk, which I gave here, that if you don't press anything, you don't click your mouse, you don't say anything, then the computer goes to the screensaver and then turns off. Okay, another one. Okay. Can you please explain what is the cause of Sankara? It is Awija, which is delusion. It is a delusion which um, of a self. It's not just the delusion of trying to get something which you think is going to be pleasant for you and you find out, it, out it's not. This is one thing the sense of self, the illusion of a self or doer, almost has to do. To convince itself of its own existence. So that's why the avijja is the main cause of will. And if a person does become enlightened, or they have these moments, of peace. It's so blissful. You don't have to do anything. The will vanishes for a little while. And that's what happens in deep meditation. You're sitting there and you don't do anything. You can't do anything. It's like you're frozen. Blissfully so. Perfectly aware of not being able to do anything. The Sankara has been temporarily stilled. 
Okay. What have we got? What are the two components of Sankara, please, Ajahn? The two come oh, I think what I said is the the active Sankara, which is the wanting, and the result of that wanting. And once you have sort of a will, you have the result of that will, like your body and the other four um so the other four candors. And those are created by the will. And all of the stuff of your your life, who you think you are, what you're doing, and all the problems and joys of your life, they're almost like the uh, result of that will in a very complicated way. Okay. Okay. So we can carry on now. Okay. If you don't understand that, please ask the questions again. And now we come to what I started with. <laughs> the page seven in my um, Word of the Buddha. And what is the noble truth of suffering? This is actually going deeper into uh, the noble truth of suffering, the first noble truth. Rebirth is suffering. You can just pause there for a while. That was the first thing which the Buddha said, rebirth is suffering. So getting reborn somewhere, that also in includes re-arising somewhere. In some of the other realms of existence, you don't get born as a baby uh, heavenly being. You're fully formed, you just re-arise with a fully mature body. And that body doesn't get old. It just stays like that for a long time. And it comes the moment when it starts to fade away. The karma which allowed you to be in that realm of existence is now disappearing. But rebirth is suffering. Aging is suffering. Aging refers to human realm. Death is suffering. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, unhappiness, and distress are suffering. Experiencing what is unpleasant is suffering. Of course, we all experience what is unpleasant. We also miss what is pleasing is suffering. Not getting what you want is suffering. In short, the five components of existence, the five candles that fully describe your body and mind as suffering. So how does that relate to your meditation? If you want to be peaceful, here you are, you want to be somewhere else, you're missing what is pleasing and that becomes suffering. If you meditate like that, trying to get somewhere, you had an experience in the past which was blissful, you want it back again, now you've made that suffering. So, and uh, experience what is unpleasant is suffering. The wanting is the suffering. If you're happy to be where you are, are you happy here? Or do you want to be somewhere else? And that becomes a very deep path of meditation. Sometimes I ask myself when I'm meditating, I interrupt the silence and say, are you happy to be here? Say it to myself. Am I happy to be in the first Bhikkhuni Vihara uh, here in Oxford? If I say, no, I want to be somewhere else, that's suffering, I can't find any peace. But if I'm happy to be here, it's so easy to meditate. There's an old saying, when you want something more, you want to be somewhere else. You can never enjoy what you already have. Uh, now, the idea of rebirth. I know some people said it means rebirth in the moment. And that, I'll introduce a word to you, a Pali word now. Hopefully, Ayat Chandra has mentioned this word to you before. It's called Gomayan. <laughs> Have you mentioned that before? No. She hasn't. Go is a, uh, a, is a bull, you know, the, the male cow, a bull. Um, a mayang is what comes out of the backside of a bull. 
I shouldn't really say bullshit, so instead I use gomayan. And so actually to say that um, rebirth is something which is in the moment is gomayan. Why do I say that? Because the translation here, which is an accurate translation from the Buddha, says in whatever type of beings, of whatever species of beings, there is rebirth coming to be, coming forth, the appearance of the candles, the acquisition of the senses, that is called rebirth. It's a normal word for rebirth. It's not something metaphysical. And there in the uh, Nidana Samyutta, which is the sutta in the Diga Nikaya, where the Buddha describes this in more detail, he mentions the various type of beings, you know, heavenly beings, human beings, one-legged beings, two-legged beings, four-legged beings. When the rebirth of, of, uh, of the previous life into that being, that's called rebirth. So, you know, you can add something like the, uh, the rebirth in the moment, but please know that the way the Buddha described it was rebirth as ordinary people would understand it. And what is aging? In whatever type of beings, the same words again, in whatever type of beings or whatever species of beings, there is aging, decrepitude, broken teeth, gray hair, wrinkled skin, shrinking with age, decay of the senses. This is called aging. And what is death? It's not death in the moment. In whatever type of beings, of whatever species of beings, there is a passing away, a demise, a disappearance, a death, a dying, decree, decease, a destruction of the candors, a discarding of the body. That is called death. And what is sorrow? Whatever, whenever by any kind of misfortune, anyone is affected by something of a painful nature, sorrow, mourning, anguish, grief, unhappiness, that is called sorrow. And what is lamentation? Whenever, I think in my modern, my newer translations, I don't call it lamentation anymore, I just call it crying. Use the ordinary words. I don't know why we have to use fancy words like lamentation. I don't know if you ever say that your kid was lamenting this morning when he was naughty and started crying his head off. No one ever says that. Whenever by any kind of misfortune, anyone is affected by something of a painful nature, and there's a crying out, weeping, making much noise for grief, wailing, that is called lamentation. What is pain? Whatever painful feeling results from bodily contact, that is called pain. And what is unhappiness? Whatever mental painful feeling arises from the mind, that is called unhappiness. So the pain and unhappiness, there's one is a bodily, physical unhappiness, the other one is a mental unhappiness. What is distress? When, whenever by any kind of misfortune, anguish arises from something of a painful or unpleasant nature, that is called distress. Now what is experiencing? What is unpleasant? Whoever has unwanted, disliked, unpleasant sights, sounds, smells, tastes, touches, or mind objects, those are the six senses, or whoever meets those who wish you harm, cause you discomfort or insecurity, that is called experiencing what is unpleasant. And what is missing, what is pleasing? Whoever has pleasant sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tangibles, and mind objects, the objects of the, objects of the six senses, or whoever encounters well-wishers, those who provide you with comfort or security, such as family or friends, and then is deprived of such interaction or connection. That is called missing what is pleasing. Just like I had had a wonderful time over in Perth with so many friends and, 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 and a monastic family, and then has to come over to, I shouldn't say this, should I? Come over to UK. Of course, you miss all those wonderful friends. But there they come back again. I love these. Yeah, they love these ones. And what is not getting what one wants? In being subject to birth, this desire might arise. 
Oh, that we are not subject to birth. Oh, that we might never be reborn. But this cannot be gained by desire. This is an example of not getting what one wants. In being subject to aging, to disease, to death, to sorrow, lamentation, pain, negativity, and distress. See, instead of saying pain, grief, and despair, I call negativity and distress. They might want, oh, that we were not subject to aging, to disease, to death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, negativity, and distress. Oh, that we, oh, that we might not come to these things. But this cannot be gained by wanting. That is another example of not getting what one wants. And now, if there's any questions, first of all, and then we come to the five components of existence, the five candors. Any questions? You are? Okay, here we go. Oh, goodness gracious. Do you want me to read it? Yeah, I can read it. Okay. First of all, somebody is asking, can Ajahn Brahm announce which suttas he is reading from in this talk, please, so I can look them up. There's many suttas which I'm reading from. And what I have done here, this is mostly the last uh, passage, was from the Digha Nikaya 22, which is the Mahanidana Sutta, the great sutta on causation, which is basically the, I think it is, yeah. And this is um, what I've done here in the word of the Buddha. It's an anthology taking a little bit from this sutta, a little bit from that sutta, to actually make it more easy to understand. And the word of the Buddha was first uh, published by a very great German monk whose name was Jnana Tiloka about a hundred years ago. And some of the translations and some of the ideas in there can be improved. And so I decided to just rewrite it, retranslate it, not to just add my own stuff to it, my own interpretations, but to make sure that everything which was said here was more accurate and more easy for people to understand. Yeah, go on. Um, just to add something to that, um, I'm not sure if this person has printed out the word of the Buddha. If you have printed it out, or if you have it on your email attachment that we sent with the Zoom link, then you'll see in the column at the side, little, uh, little, numbers so it says for example dn 22 so dn stands for digga nikaya then it will say mn which stands for majima nikaya sn stands for samyutta nikaya so maybe one of the co-hosts at some point could um give that like a key and then you can look in the sutta and you can find the number of the sutta so it's just a shorthand that we've put on the side but all the sutta references are there in that document so I hope that can help. Okay, what have we got here? Okay, is it that simple about letting go of wanting? If it is that simple, why is it so hard? Is what happens if you practice the Eightfold Path? The Eightfold Path is the cause of wanting disappearing. And it is a hard thing to do, but the more you let go of wanting, the more you don't become a control freak, you let things be, the happier and more peaceful you become. Why? Because you're letting go of suffering. Sometimes it will take many years, sometimes lifetimes, but it's worth doing. It's the only thing worth doing. Will it? No. I seem to make the same mistakes many times. The suffering is to get too much before one learns. Why is this happening? Thank you. It's, you don't need to make that mistake. Even small amounts of suffering hurt. So if one learns how to let go more, then one suffers much less. And the main way to end that clinging onto things which causes suffering, the main way to allow uh, wanting to cease is to not look at the object of wanting, 
but look at the thing which does the wanting. This illusory self. A good example of that. How's the time going? How are we going good? A good example of that is the simile which I gave in one of my books of the driverless bus. I gave this simile first of all over 30 years ago, way before Google decided to actually put that as a nice marketing technique for getting a car or a bus which didn't need a driver. Again, I wish I could have patented these ideas when I was young. And then a Patachara Bhikkhuni Monastery, not so Patachara, Anukampa Bhikkhuni Monastery would not have any trouble at all paying its bills. But that was my mistake, not sort of patenting these, these ideas. But anyway, the driverless bus simile goes like this. Life is like a bus journey, and often your bus goes through very painful experiences. And so you tell the bus driver, now get out of here. Why didn't you go to these painful places? And what happens when you ask the bus driver to get out of difficult or painful experiences? Your bus driver puts his foot on the brake and parks or goes slow. The painful experiences of your life last longer than they should. And when you have pleasant experiences, for example, you're listening to a wonderful retreat from uh, Anukampa Bhikkhuni project, Rihara. You're enjoying it so much, and then it tends to finish too early. That's like your bus driver going through wonderful scenery, and you ask the bus driver, slow down or park. I'm enjoying this part of my life. And then your bus driver puts his foot down on the accelerator and you speed through it. The good times don't last as long as they should. So after a while in life, you realize the biggest problem is the bus driver, your will, choice, wanting. Why is it that your will, take, you're supposed to be taking you to some peaceful places and end up causing you trouble? Well, after a while, you've got to instruct the will on the right way to drive a bus. But to be able to instruct the will, you've got to find where that will is, is in your mind, first of all. You have to go to the bus driver's seat. And eventually, in meditation, you arrive at the bus driver's seat. And when you do, you get one of the biggest insights in your life. It's shocking but it's also relieving. You find your bus driver doesn't exist. There's no one in the seat. It's an automatic bus, a driverless bus. There's no one in there. Your sense of self was a delusion. So what happens next? It's obvious what happens next. You go back to your seat and you stop complaining. You stop wanting. It's a waste of time shouting at the bus driver. You know, stop, go fast, get here, go there. There's no bus driver there. That's a simile. So that, that's actually where you can um, stop the, um, the wanting. And you understand there's no one there to do the wanting. Can you understand that? Can you do that? Eventually you will. So be careful listening to talks from good monks or good nuns because we put these ideas into you. It is like brainwashing, I admit that. I was brainwashed by Ajahn Chah. And you can't get rid of these ideas. Eventually you understand them. Well, another question. And that's it, yeah. That's it. Okay, so let's get on the five candles. You've heard about these things before. In Pali, they call it skanda. So, no, that's in Sanskrit, of course, skanda. This is called uh, the candle in the Pali. And this is supposed to, according to the Buddha, describe everything. So, I call it five components of existence. Well, what else do they call it? 
I've been using this such a long time. Five hundred. Well, we don't like them. Yeah, aggregates. Aggregates is what I used to use to put in the cement mixer whenever I was making concrete. Concrete. I used to have one one shovel of cement, three of sand, and five of aggregate. It was like stone. So this is not what the five aggregates mean here. And how in particular are the five components of existence suffering? The five components of existence are as follows. The body, that's the rupa. The next is experience. Too many people translate that as feeling. It's vedana. If you look carefully at how the Buddha explained these things, experience is a much more accurate, um, accurate translation. Of course, there is many types of experience: pleasant experience, unpleasant experience, or neutral experience. It's not feeling; it's experience. And perception, and that is a brilliant translation. You can't do better than that. That's for the third kind of sanya. Zankara, you've already heard me translate that as will. Instead of, oh, what's some of the other translations of Sankara? Volitional reactions. Volitional reactions, that's far too complicated. Volitional activities, yeah. So will or willed things. That is a far more accurate and meaningful translation. Sometimes it can scare you. It's accurate. Traditional formations are just you know, too ephemeral, too like a cloud. It doesn't touch you so deeply, but will does. And so I've got here will and other mental formations, things caused, formed by will. Fine. And lastly, the fifth of the candors. Okay, it's uh, a different translation than most people do, but it's far more accurate. Consciousness is the plural. And all the time the Buddha so translated what is vinyana, the six consciousnesses. If we call vinyana just one consciousness, it's not accurate to how the Buddha defined it. Call it consciousness is in the plural, and that opens up much more possibilities of insight into the nature of reality as we know it. So consciousness is. These are the five components of existence that are suffering. And this is called the noble truth of suffering. And then this is uh, from the Mahavedala Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya. Is that fuel, this is upadana. Upadana means uptaking. Sometimes people can call it attachment. Another translation of that is fuel. It's like petrol or gas or electricity. It fuels, make things go, drives things. Is the upadana the same as these five components of existence, or is it fuel something apart from the five components of existence? And you say this because sometimes people say the five components of existence are suffering, and sometimes they explain that as saying the five components of, of existence affected by upadana are suffering, implying that five components of existence apart from suffering, so apart from upadana, are not suffering. And this is how the Buddha replied. The fuel is neither the same as the five components of existence, nor is the fuel separate from the five components of existence. It is the desire and wanting that is part of these five components of existence, that is the fuel that sustains them. In other words, that which sustains this uh, dependent origination, the five components of existence, the fuel is within this process called the five components of existence. In other words, it's self-sustaining, 
self fueling. It's not fuel from outside. Now, this last little passage, how are we going for time? Oh, good. Seven minutes. Yes. And this is an accurate translation. And I mention this because sometimes people want to find something which is important, some essential part of existence outside of the five components, outside of the five candors. This is how the Buddha described it. Any kind of body, whatever, whether past, future or present, one's own or others, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, this is the body component of existence. All bodies should be seen as they really are with correct wisdom thus. This is not mine. You don't own this. This I am not. This is not a permanent essence. Instead of calling it a soul or a self, I go to something which is close to the original Pali, a permanent essence. Any kind of experience, Vedana, whatever, whether past, future or present, one's own or others, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, this is the experience component of existence and all experience should be seen as it really is with correct wisdom all experience this is not mine this i am not this is not a permanent essence any kind of perception whatever past future or present one's own or others gross or subtle inferior or superior far or near this is the perception component of existence and all perception should be seen as it really is with correct wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not a permanent essence. Any kind of will and other mental formations, whatever, whether past, future or present, one's own or others, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, this is the will and mental formations component of existence. All will should be seen as it really as they really are, with correct wisdom thus. This is not mine. You don't own the will. This I am not. You are not the will. This is not a permanent essence. And lastly, any kind of consciousness whatever, any kind of consciousness, not just the mental consciousness, the uh, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, as well as knowing. Any kind of consciousness, whatever, whether past, future or present, one's own or others, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, that is the consciousness's component of existence. And all consciousnesses should be seen as it really is with correct wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not a permanent essence. All consciousness is not your essence, not yourself. So anyway, let's see what questions we have. Okay. Okay. The only way I could halfway understand dependent origination is by changing the step consciousness into sense consciousnesses. If you mean the six consciousnesses, that's fine. But if you try and exclude the mind consciousness, that is not how the Buddha explained it. How could there be anything before consciousness itself? Consciousness is not a self. Sometimes trying to look at consciousness as a permanent thing, uh, it, as a, itself, consciousness is not a permanent essence, it's not a self. Okay, what does it mean? How could there be anything before consciousness? 
it's a previous consciousness. That's one of the reasons why the Buddha said that it are, is the five hindrances which feed consciousness. And consciousness, the other description uh, of dependent origination is consciousness and the objects of consciousness. You know, vinyana and nama rupa. It's nama rupa, basically the objects of the six consciousnesses. That sustains consciousness and consciousness sustains nama rupa. You need an object of consciousness. And once you have an object of consciousness, you have the consciousness. To have an image on your computer screen, you need a computer, you need the object. If one of those disappears, then there's no image. So before consciousness itself, Consciousness is not a fundamental, essential thing. It too is a result of things. Every sense consciousness you know, is caused by you know, having the object of consciousness, like something to be seen, and say side consciousness, and they come close enough together to actually be impacted one on the other, and it turns on this contact, and that causes sensory experience. And that's also with the mind as well. The mind needs something to know. When those two come together, and they call contact arises, then there will be the experience of mind, knowing if you like. But knowing is not a permanent thing which is always there. It disappears. And that is actually what happens when you you see these things, you experience these things when you go into the Arupa meditations, the immaterial meditations. And the process of the immaterial meditations are where consciousness, mind consciousness, just turns off, disappears. Okay. Three very similar questions. So does Nibbana mean total disappearance of a self? There are two types of Nibbana. The first type of Nibbana is called Nibbana with something remaining. And that is when a person becomes an Arahat. What do you like? like when the Buddha became an Arahat? He didn't disappear. His bodily candor was still there. His Vedana was still there. Perception was still there. Will was still there based on the past. And it was consciousness is still there. So that is when they, we call it that uh, Sat Pari Sesa Nibbana, with consciousness, so with uh, things still remaining. But we got At Pari Sesa Nibbana, with nothing remaining. And that is what happens at what they call Pari Nibbana. And the Pari Nibbana, or Pari Nibbana, that is where the Buddha. But um, Kusinara ceased without remainder, with nothing left. People often think of Nirvana as an unceasing bliss. It is an unceasing bliss, but to understand why, have a look at the Yamaka Sutta. It's only a bliss because there's nothing left to experience the bliss. It's all gone. Should we think of disappearing? Look at the Yamaka Sutta for that. If should we think of disappearance of self the same as total unceasing bliss, it sounds much nicer, but the truth is that there's nothing to be felt ever again. Well, the disappearance of self and craving, etc., lead one to bliss. You get bliss, 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 and then everything vanishes. Richard, so Nibbana means putting all things down. No, because then there's no one to put things down. It's not an activity. Nibbana is when things cease. Understanding that the flame was caused by three things, and when those three things stop, the flame disappears. It doesn't go to the heaven of all flames. The problem with human beings, if they haven't penetrated you know, through the Eightfold Path and through the jhanas into understanding these things, they always try and attach and hold on to some, what I call the ultimate retirement home of the self where, okay, many things you let go of, 
but there's one place where you can live happily ever after. You know, the Cinderella delusion, where you find nice Nibbana, a new Nibbana, right off into the sunset, happily ever after forever. Sounds nice, but it doesn't exist. What happens to the body after death of an enlightened being, Atom, please? Does it exist in the form of energy as a karmic energy has been extinguished? The body after the death of an enlightened one, the body just is rupa. It just goes back to the soil. It just uh, decays. Although there are some enlightened beings, if you look in the suttas, I like this weird stuff, that like Ananda, he rose up into the air. You know, this is the Venerable Ananda, the uh, chief attendant, and entered the fire element and just vanished in a ball of flame. And he left because many disciples he had some of all his disciples they wanted his relics so out of kindness after rising up into the air above the river then he determined that he'd have an equal set of relics on either side of the river bank to make sure his disciples didn't get upset and angry anyway okay that's it. Okay. Anyone is not happy with this, and if you are happy with this, congratulations, you may be enlightened. If you're not unhappy with if you are unhappy with this, it happens to be true. So you can ask the questions this evening. Okay. So thank you, Ajahn, for a very inspiring and challenging. To yeah. the class, and it's supposed to be challenging because otherwise we don't grow. Yeah. So we're going to meet again at six thirty. So please, as usual, especially for the meditations, please come on time so that our wonderful co-hosts can get into their meditation uh, because they were also registered on this retreat. And um, we'll sit for about fifty minutes, and at the end of that meditation, we'll chant the Metta Sutta, which you will have in English, uh, along with your Zoom link. So we'll chant that, and you can chant along with us if you wish. Great! So please enjoy the suffering <laughs> of the next one and a half hours, and see if you can have that suffering with a cup of tea or something else of your choosing. And we'll see you back here very soon. Take care.